afternoon. Welcome to the museum. I can have the lights up just a little. I have a few people I wanted to introduce in the audience. Thank you. Uh, my name is Harold Rubin. I'm the public programs coordinator for the museum. Uh, we have an outstanding program for you this afternoon. As a courtesy to our speakers, I would ask that you please uh, silence your cell phones. Thank you for your help with that. Uh, before today's program begins, I would like to make you aware of some upcoming museum events. Next Saturday, July 22nd, it's about half bad, but we decided to come in and hear three uh, distinguished speakers talk about their account uh, over North Africa. Um, I did want to thank, um, it, it's a privilege, I get such a kick out of this because they asked me to come moderate these things, I was like, oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> the American Fighter Races Association sponsors these, and uh, Dean Wolf, uh, Ernie Lee, and Cheryl Dart, and a number of other people organize these things. I just get to walk up on stage and ask questions and listen to these wonderful gentlemen. Um, we do have kind of an interesting mix today. We've got, uh, um, oh, we got Mr. Ross, who was a P-38 driver, and uh, I'm going to struggle with your last name, Hamilton, but I'll get it. Ham McWorthy. McWorthen? <laughs> yeah, quarter pounder. No. <laughs> um, and uh, Ham, uh, or Mac, uh, flew F4Fs off the aircraft carrier Ranger in support of Operation Torch. Uh, if you know your military history, uh, that's when the Americans kind of mixed it up for the first time down in North Africa. So that's a very uh, unique situation as well. And uh, to kind of round things out, we've got uh, James Stocky Edwards. And uh, Stocky Edwards was down in uh, North Africa in 1942 flying uh, the P-40 Kitty Hawk and uh, stayed in the theater for quite some time and ended up in Spitfires. So all of them have a kind of an interesting view of North Africa and the warfare that was being fought there. Um, I think we can start with Stocky, but I think what I'll ask is, I know that some of you have a few stories you want to tell, um, and uh, Herb, I know you want to share one about a P-51, but I'm going to start off with Stocky, and then we'll go to Herb, and then we'll go to Mac, if that's okay, and then we'll talk about your area of operation, the type of aircraft, and the types of things you flew in North Africa, but Stocky, why don't you start off with the story you were telling me earlier today. That's me. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my thanks for being invited down here into the United States to meet all you nice people. My wife and I, Tony, a little closer, he says. And that's better. My wife and I, Tony, would like to thank all of you for treating us so good. We've always been treated great in, in the States. We spent two tours in Colorado Springs and Norad, and it was probably the best time of, of my career. We really enjoyed it. Now, the story, and we start off with our Air Force. Too bad you weren't at our little luncheon last night. We had stories coming out the years. They never closed the hangar doors. And the story, that perhaps you'd like to hear just now, where we're, we had taken North Africa and we're into, into Malta, moving into take Italy, and we were getting ready to take off with, with a squadron, of, a wing of Spitfires, and go over Sicily. The group commander is leading, and as we're taxiing out, he has a number two who's brand new and who's kind of scared and jittery, and he too chews the tail off of the, his commander's Spitfire. <laughs> and this is quite an embarrassing situation. The, the group commander is an old battle ridden pilot, very experienced. He gets out and he looks at this poor chap who is about in tears and he says, Son, you've, I've got no airplane, so let's go to the bar. <laughs> 
my start. <laughs> yes, up to you, Greg. Thank you. Um, Herb, you had a story you shared with me. Uh, maybe you'd like to share that with the audience as well. Okay, fine. Um, you know, the, the three of us sitting up here are really tr trigger pullers when you come right down to it. Uh, it took a lot of work on the part of the airmen and the enlisted people who did the marvelous job of keeping the airplanes flying through World War II and Korea and Vietnam. But had not been for these people that did this excellent job of keeping the airplanes flying, the three of us probably would have not been here today. So we give our thanks, <coughs> excuse me, we give our thanks to the airmen and all, in all categories of the service, Navy, Army, Air Force, and so on, for doing a wonderful job to help our nation be what it is today. Uh, not only that, uh, every once in a while, uh, uh, outstanding people show up and help us with our job of doing a good job flying airplanes and so on. Uh, years ago, I got acquainted with Mr. Bob Hoover. Uh, some of you may have you know, we had the, the test pilot who years ago flew the yellow P-51 around air shows and, and uh, races and that sort of thing. And uh, he first came to Korea when I was flying F-86s and displayed uh, how well the, the F-86 could fly. And he showed a lot of us uh, that the airplane was a lot more capable than we thought it was. Well, anyway, uh, years ago, I was a wing commander in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And the military and civilian, the, the manufacturers, aircraft manufacturers, had a safety seminar there at Myrtle Beach. That's a, a community that is a, a resort type, a lot of golf courses up and so on. Well, anyway, this uh, uh, safety seminar started in on a Thursday and uh, went through Saturday till noon. And of course, Bob Hoover flew his yellow P-51, and uh, some of my captains decided, well, why don't we get Bob Hoover to do an air show for us, you know, on Saturday, and when we're all through. They, because I told them, you gotta get the air sterilized for 15 miles around the airport, and so on. And, but uh, if you can get that done and get okay with the FAA, you can go ahead and ask him to do an air show, and Bob was happy to agree to do it. Well, anyway, uh, on Saturday morning, when, they, when the seminar ended, about noon, we walked out of the officers' club, and some the word had gotten to downtown that the civilians were invited, and I had 6,000 people on the flight line. Well, anyway, anyway, uh, Bob got on the, the P-51 and uh, did a beautiful air show, you know, landing on one wheel and hopping over on the on the other, loops and rolls and so on, and. Uh, they even spun the airplane. Uh, then on downwind leg, uh, he started rolling the airplane, doing slow rolls. And uh, about opposite the people, uh, instead of putting the gear down, he, while the airplane's inverted, he puts the gear handle down and the gear pops up. You know, things like that are unique. But I noticed that on downwind leg, the engine was putting out some black smoke. And, uh, and it had a popping sound, not normal like we'd find a Mustang. Well, at any rate, he's rolling, and then on the, the base leg is rolling and so on. Then I'm finally still rolling, and he's about 300 feet high, inverted, and the engine quit cold. No sound. And he did about a half snap roll back to right side up, okay? And, uh, but the loss of power, he touched down a couple of hundred feet short of where the runway was, and there was a lip in this overrun up onto the runway, about eight to 10 inches high, and when the gear hit, hit this lip, it folded the gear out from underneath the airplane, and here he slides down the runway off the bell of the airplane for about, about, about three or 400 feet. Well, uh, you know, being a commander, I've been a little excited about having accidents. Well, anyway, I jumped in my staff car and drove out real quickly to, to find out if everything was okay. And there he was, standing off the wingtip of the airplane, straightening his tie, and he says, kind of a bad landing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, a lot of funny things have happened to most of us al along the line, and uh, I'll leave that one as a starter. Thank you so much.
Yeah, yeah I thought it was a good, good story. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I want to start off by saying what, what a pleasure it is to be here. And I say that quite a bit over I flew 89 combat missions and shot on 12 planes. In order to get credit for a combat mission, you have to make contact with the enemy, either on the ground or in the air. And you know what? They had this nasty habit of shooting at you with a lot of guns. <laughs> My first combat was actually in North Africa. We went aboard the Old Ranger in October of 1942, and we stopped off in Bermuda waiting for the invasion force to come back. And they finally got together, and on the 25th of October, we left Bermuda on the Ranger and joined up with the invasion force, something like 500 ships. It covered an area about 20 square miles. It didn't sail very fast. And we got to the, off the coast of North Africa, the French Morocco, in the Castle Black area on the morning of 8 November 1942. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get in on the very first strike that morning. But the first strike was actually almost into the target before we knew whether the Vichy French, who were going to in charge there at the time. There were negotiations going on trying to get them to support our invasion. And we didn't know whether or not they were going to oppose us or not. So they had arranged a password, if you want to call it. The strike was almost into the Castle Lake area when the Admiral in charge broadcast a message. He said, play ball. That meant that they were going to oppose us, which they had. They had already started strafing the invasion force, which was coming ashore about 20 or so miles north of Casablanca. The, our squadron mates on that first flight we shot down six of the French planes opposing us. But when we got off, about eight o'clock, we had to go up and fly a combat patrol over the invasion force. So we sat up there and actually was called board holes for about hour and a half, didn't see anything. All the French planes were about refueling. And then we got a call that three busy French destroyers were leaving the harbor in Casablanca and heading up towards the invasion force. So we headed down there. And my first combat mission was that's the strafing of Vichy French destroyer. To make things more interesting, our flight leader, he, he pushed over. He said, this is for real, boys. And he was about halfway down, and he got hit by an aircraft round. His plane starts smoking. And he got a little excited, said, I'm hitting, I'm hit. I'm hit. And, but he managed to land and on the shore. And he, he was a prisoner for four days. But now we were, probably only had about two 
250 hours, flight time, time. We were waiting to go in and make our attack. We strafed them about three times, and the 50 caliber, we were fine with go right through the half inch plate that the destroyers had. After about the third run, all the three ships turned and suddenly and ran up on the beach. So that was my first combat flight. We, we flew two more days there. It was very, very costly to our squadron. Four of my squadron mates were shot down by any aircraft fire and kill. And I had a very close to mess up on my second combat flight, which was in one of the command posts, on a small caliber, round, Kimba, it missed, we had bulletproof glass right in front. And it hit just to the left of the bulletproof glass. Probably passed my head about six inches. So that was, that was my first close. It was on the morning of 11 November. We had a strike going in. And they got about halfway there. And they found, got the word that the fishy fish had capitulated. But it was very touching time because the German submarines and the French submarines were in the area. And the morning we were leaving up, our five inch guns suddenly started opening up. And I looked out of a porthole window and I actually saw a torpedo trap coming right toward the stern of the Ranger. But luckily, I guess they had it set too deep because it went underneath the ship. But they did sink some of the invasion force. So it was a very short but the cost of war for us over those four days. We lost four pilots and we lost seven planes and all. Thank you. Stocky, I was wondering if you might uh, talk about, uh, you got down into North Africa uh, a year or so before the Americans showed up and you were uh, flying a P-40, you were up against some German talent and uh, I think also maybe the Italians, did the Italians show up down there as well? Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and maybe uh, share some of your memories about those uh, early days? Oh, quickly, uh, I, I um, trained in Canada on Tiger Watson and Harbors, and then went to England and trained on hurricanes. Uh, and by the fall of 41, we were sent out to the Middle East. Closer? Closer? <laughs> we were sent to the Middle East, and we landed in, North, in the West Africa, and ferried hurricanes across uh, Tarzan's jungle and over to Cairo. And from there, eventually joined the squadron about Christmas time of 41. When we arrived in the squadron, there, and very seldom do they have rain there, but they had a deluge of some sort, and, and uh, the aircraft were grounded. Two JU-88s had arrived over the field and dropped their bombs, and this is what we saw when we got out of our, our transport aircraft that had taken us there. And uh, we found out that our squadron was in disarray, that six of the pilots had been shot down, the day before, and everybody was pretty miserable. From then on, we were pushed back to the Calic, uh, Cairo Alex Road in, in North Africa. The Germans had advanced. Um, we had flown, we had gone from hurricanes to chaos, B-40s. And we, most of our air, uh, escort were escorting bombers and doing strafing and bombing. By the time that Alabama came, I had, I had about 80 uh, sorties and uh, missions in, in a P-40. 
we had been on almost every escort we went on, the 109s attacked us. Uh, they, had, they seemed to use us as target practice. Uh, we had no real uh, defense against them, but we had kept our bombers under protection. By the time LM-8 came, we had been becoming an Allied force. The USAF pilots had come out of their squadrons and joined us. We had South Africans, and British, uh, of all types, New Zealanders and Australians and so on. It became a real Allied force. And the uh, uh, flying in the desert was nothing like we see today. We operated with, with very little water. Uh, enough to get by. Nobody ever went hungry. Sometimes it was bully beef and hardtack for days, uh, particularly in the beginning and six, for six months. Uh, and there, you didn't have a shower or you might have a, a, a cleanup once a week. And occasionally we would get near the sea where we could have a swim. Then no one seemed to complain. Uh, ground crew never got off the squadron. They did a wonderful job. I must say here, I repeat that they, we never went short of fuel and we never went short of ammunition. Airplanes were always ready to go and sometimes the ground crew would be up at 3 o'clock in the morning running them up, long before dawn. And whenever we got shot up, they were quickly patched. And, and uh, they had no servicing really in the desert that we have today. But everything went on from day to day. Uh, I only knew of one person who wanted to get out of there to quit. Well, you might say we were young and, and stupid, but it was great. <laughs> the sun shone most of the time, we became very tan. Uh, we had no we recourse to getting out and enjoy ourselves until we got back to, to before the LMA, we had moved back to the Cairo Alex Road. And then we could get into Alexandria or Cairo once in a while. And then once they started back up the desert, when the re Germans were retreating after Alamein, it was no go again until we got through into in Tunisia, some months later. Um, it was a great experience. I went out as a sergeant pilot. I flew uh, P-40s. Uh, first of all, they were very difficult to cope with compared to some of the other airplanes I flown, but it was a very sturdy aircraft and very reliable, and we learned to, to like them. A great Straffers and dive bomber aircraft. And by the time we got through in Tunisia, we had, I had some 200 trips, missions we call them, and we were very confident with our airplanes. The, from then on, the, the, everything went out of Tunisia and back into Sicily and Italy. And that was uh, my quick brief on the desert. Great. Thank Great. You. Herb Ross, you, uh, you found yourself in the cockpit of a P-38 in North Africa. Maybe you'd like to share a little bit with the audience what that experience was like. Yeah, I liked it very much. I thought very much of the P-38. I think it was a wonderful airplane. Uh, some of the advantages, of course, were the counter-rotating propellers. So there was no torque to the left or to the right as you changed power settings. The guns were right in the nose, the 450 caliber machine guns and the 20 millimeter cannon. So it had concentrated power, not the guns out in the, in the wings like many of the single engine fighters. Uh, the first airplane I shot down was a Mackie 202, and it was on my third mission over Palermo, Sicily. Um, it was kind of an unusual event, because this was, I hadn't even seen an enemy aircraft prior to that mission. The first two missions were escorts over Tunisia and uh, uh, the heavies, and I didn't see an enemy, one a single enemy aircraft. But on this third mission, uh, the bombers were going in southbound from about 50 miles north of Palermo and then heading southbound. And then they would turn to the right and head, head back to Africa for a home. So we were escorting them and being as green as I was, I was a, a, a flight leader off on the right hand side 
And as the bombers turned in southbound, I had to go over the top of them, uh, and I then went too far. And I went too far out. I was probably about two or three miles out to the left, uh, away from the squadron and the bombers, which is a kind of a critical mistake when you come right down to it. But on the way back catching up with the bombers, I saw two single engine fighters a little below us and uh, behind the B-17s and behind the other uh, P-38s. And I thought, well, that looks like a P-40 to me. What are the P-40s doing out over this water this far anyway? You know, this thing lands an airplane. And then I realized it wasn't a P-40, it was a Mackie 202. So, well, by golly, I said to my element leader, you go after the wingman, I'll go after the, the number one Mackie. So I added power and started in down after him, and then he saw me coming, and he turned violently to the right. Uh, when I say violently, it's about as sharp as you can get. So uh, I'm pulling it, pulling G's on the on the P-38, and he's getting a little bit ahead of me. So I realized, hey, I've got fowler flaps. I can put the flaps down, and I can outturn that guy. So I gave it a little bit of down flap, and I could stay with him in the turn. So I gave it a little bit more, and I could outturn him. I thought I get so away. I worked until I got the pepper well ahead of him. And then I pulled the trigger, but the tracers went behind it. You can see the tracers, and they were well behind it. So I realized I needed more lead. So I pulled in tighter and shot again. Again, the tracers went behind it. Two more times the tracers went behind it. And I thought, well, I can't get it. I can't get the nose far enough forward. He disappears under the nose of the airplane. I like, so I can't get the picker on him or far enough ahead of him to get him. So we went around the circle about three times. I couldn't get him, and I could out to, to shoot at him. And he couldn't get me because I could out turn him. So I began to realize, this is a World War I Lovebury circle we got ourselves in. You know? So what am I going to do now? Well, the guy made the mistake. He thought he could out climb a P-38. Yeah. <laughs> you know? He pulled out vertical. And boy, here's my opportunity. I got right up behind him, about 200 feet behind him, put the pepper on him, pulled the trigger, and boom, the airplane caught on fire and he bailed out. About 22 miles from land, so he had a pretty good swim to get back. <laughs> but anyway, that was my first experience in shooting down an enemy airplane, and I begin to when I think, look, you've got to be able to figure out how to do better than that other guy. Make him do, make him make the first mistake. Because if you make the first mistake, you might not live to talk about it. So that was the first lesson I learned about shooting down enemy airplanes. Now, I'm going to tell you about the last airplane I shot down now, which was an FW-190. And I had not learned what I, I found out on that mission. I could outturn that FW-190 quite easily. Okay? He's a big, heavy airplane, and the later models had a big, heavy engine in them. So he had a lot of power, and uh, uh, he was coming in on me, and I wanted to get to headed nose to nose with him, because they didn't like the 20 millimeter cannon, the 450s, and they would usually break off on a head-to-head -head pass with a P-38. Well, this guy did. He broke off and turned tightly to the right and started to climb. But, I followed him through the climb, and as he turned up like this, he went right on into what we would call an Immelman turn, half of a loop. And when he was here on the top, he rolled from inverted to right side up. Well, I had followed him through, and now I'm inverted, and just as he rolled out, those few seconds, the pimper went right on his tail and I pulled the trigger. The first time I realized the guns in the P-38 would run even though you're inverted. They would fire, and I shot the ME with the FW-109 down. So that was the last uh, airplane I shot down. Now, in between, we did some work that, that I, I thought was very, very important. Uh, the bombers we escorted, and that was our main core, our main objective was to protect the bombers, would go outbound over the Mediterranean, whether it was from Sicily or Italy, and then occasionally one would get shot down, or sometimes two or three would get shot down, not by enemy aircraft, by, by flak, uh, anti-aircraft fire. And on the outbound, they would bail out over the Mediterranean, 
and the British people flying the Sunderland flying boats would land in the Mediterranean and pick up the crews that had bailed out. And we always had a six-man P-38 escort for these dumbos, what would you call the Sunderlands, uh, pick, landing and picking up the crews that had bailed out. Well, my hat really goes off to the RAF for what they did to pick up the American airmen when they did bail out. They literally saved thousands of lives. On this one mission that I was on, and it lasted about eight hours, they landed and picked up 30 crewmen. Uh, they, the way they would do it, they would fly courses back and forth with about 20 people looking out the window of the field glasses trying to search for bailed out crews. And when they'd find one, they'd land. Uh, and if there were two or three, they'd taxi over to the, to the other crew and pick them up. Of course, they were, they were dead ducks, you know, if they were sitting still in the water for an enemy aircraft. So that's why it was so important for us to give them an escort. Well, anyway, they had picked up about 30 crewmen on this, on this particular mission. It was getting pretty close to sundown. And we were heading back uh, towards Africa. We were released by the commander of the, of the Sunderland, could go leave them and go back home. So on the way back, we were about 2,000 feet high and uh, kind of spread out and relaxed. I mean, we were really suffering from TV, tired butt, you know, for eight hours in, in the airplane. And we're back, and all of a sudden, I see 15 airplanes below me. They were Ju-52. They were just like our C-47s. They were uh, ferrying crews and, and so on around. Well, to make a long story short, the six of us shot down all 15 of those airplanes. And, uh, kind of a bad news for the drone. So, Shooting down an enemy airplane can be a most unusual thing. Uh, all, under all kinds of circumstances, they are shot down. Uh, uh, both the P-38s, which had excellent characteristics of turning, and the power of climbing. Some of the Navy airplanes were outstanding because of the ruggedness. And I first flew the P-40, which this young man did, and that was the first fighter I flew. Thank you, Bert. Stocky, you, uh, you mixed it up with a number of uh, Luftwaffe pilots, and uh, I noticed that you uh, had a lot of encounters with any 109s. I was wondering if there's one or two that particularly stand out in your mind. The pilots? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'd like to have a couple of quick things. Uh, perhaps I should tell you about my first victory since, since Herb did. We had just converted to the Kitty Hawks, and we had a few hours on them, and we were going to escort the light bombers over this uh, aerodrome, this Hun aerodrome. It was in the North, North Africa, and the aerodrome was called Martuba. We were flying off a base near uh, Tobruk, up in, the, in the desert. I was flying number two to a man that we were flying close escort to the, to the Bostons. The Bostons were flying very tight formation, about a dozen of them. And as we, 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 uh, our, tar our route was out over the Mediterranean and then we go back in south over the, this enemy airfield and drop the bombs. As we approached the, the land from the sea, he could see the dust tails coming off the fields down below and, and I recognized it as an aerodrome and I thought, those must be fighters that looked like little airplanes, tiny, tiny, we were about 12,000, 8 to 12,000 feet. And we made a turn. We we're just approaching the field, and I see these three fighters come right up through the bombers on their tails, climbing. And I thought, boy, they're 109s. And they're, they are pretty looking things. They look like little cigars when they're in, and going straight up. We went a little further. The three Bostons were hit with a flak, went up in flames. Then they dropped their bombs and they turned sharply left and nose down. And we we had spread out because the flak was coming up close to us. We had moved away a little bit from the bombers, my the number one and I. And as we made a turn to catch up, a 109 popped up in between us. It must have been one of those three. 
and he wasn't he wasn't more than 75 yards behind my leader and he did a wing over quickly and he was right on his tail and he ended up unfortunately right in front of me and, and I don't know uh, to this day what how I came about all these things but I just pulled the trigger and he came apart and this was all happening in quick seconds um, the, my leader went, went kept in his turn, the, the one and I went down, I made a sharp turn and there was, I looked out to the right and there was an aircraft coming in on me. He wasn't more than 100 yards away, I could see the, the hole in front of his spinner, the propeller, and, and he dropped his nose. And instinct, being a, a hunter when I was a kid, told me he had perfect deflection on me. I, and immediately, in all fear, pushed the stick right forward in, in the P-40. And, and, and of course, all the, the dust and sand and it came right up to my face. But, but my airplane reacted and went straight down. And I kept going straight down until I got near the ground and hoping that nobody would follow me, and they didn't. But, the, but that was my first victory. My leader had seen it being shot down. and. Uh, he had a tangle with another one after that. He ran out of fuel and he had to land by the army. He went in the desert and they refueled him and, and he came home. But when I arrived home, after that of course I was a bit lost, couldn't see anybody. I made my way back down along the coast, that was the simplest part, and I apparently crossed over in my field and saw where the bombers were taken off from and recognized there and flew back to our place. And I landed and, and parked way out in the desert, walking back to the tent, the operational tent. My seal came by in the car and he tells, you know, he didn't say hello, or he said, get in. So he said, oh, I get in. I want to tell somebody I shot this 109 down, and, and nobody seems to want to listen. So we get back to the tent and seal was upset because three bombers had been shot down and two of the Kitty Hawks hadn't returned. And, and he gets a phone call saying that, from the army, saying, we have this Kitty Hawk here, he's uh, being refueled, he'll be home shortly. And that cheered him up a bit, was my leader. And, and so then he finally looked around and he saw me and he said, uh, Edwards, what were you doing? You know, like, uh, where were you? And uh, I said, sir, I shot a one and nine down. <laughs> and he said, you did? And then, of course, he was, he was really delirious after that. <laughs> If I uh, remember correctly, Stocky, um, uh, out of the Royal Canadian Air Force in North Africa, uh, if I believe it uh, correctly, you're the highest scoring ace for the Royal Canadians in the North African theater. Right. Yeah, well, there you go, folks. <laughs> Mac uh, went on to the uh, South Pacific, and I was wondering if you'd maybe share uh, some of one or two of your aerial encounters in the South Pacific. We got back to North Africa at the end of November 1942. Um, my squadron VF-9 <coughs> was the first squadron to get the new F-6F Hellcat. Well, <coughs> checked out on that. And, and, and on 20 May of 1943, we went aboard the, the new Essex and headed on down through the canal and, and arrived at Pearl Harbor in you know, May 1943. We didn't have any forward bases out there at the time. We trained around Pearl Harbor until August waiting for the New York town to get out there so we'd have enough carriers to go out and start fighting the Japs again. At the end of August, we left the Pearl Harbor, sailed all the way up to Marcus Island, which was 700 miles from Tokyo. It was actually a a training strike, both the air groups and the ships 
It was also a kind of wake up call to the Jets, saying, Hey, we are back. Marcus Strike was uneventful in a way. It was a very small island. Caught him completely by surprise. He burned about 10 twin engine bombers on the field with no air opposition. So we headed on back to Pearl. Then in early October of 43, we went back out and, and struck Wake Island. And there was an incredible amount of anti aircraft fire there. That's where I saw my first zero. Uh, I was aware I managed to, sh to shoot down the first one. After Wake, we went back to Pearl. And then on 1 November, the Marines had landed on Bougainville, down in the southwest Pacific. And they learned that the Japanese were massing a large number of ships and support ships to go down and push the Marines back off of the island. And they were in the harbor at Rabao, which is the New Britain Island. To the northwest from Bougainville. So we went down, we got down to Bougainville in about the 10th, I guess it was about the 9th of November. And then on the, on the 11th of November, we were launched from about 150 miles southeast of Rabaul. We flew all the way in. There was high cloud. The tops were about 10,000 feet. And we were flying on top of about, about 12,000 feet. We escorted our bombers. The bombers flew what, what we call a box squad Martian, all in one, one group. And we would fly about 1,000 feet above them. We split up our divisions. We were about 500 feet out on either either side, giving cover to the bombers. The first half of the flight was very uneventful. And then about 40, 50 miles from the bow, we picked up another escort. About 50 or so zeros showed up. And they started flying a couple thousand feet above us on either side. And we didn't do anything at first. And strange as some of the jet piles were doing aerobatics up there and stuff, trying to entice us to come up, I guess. But I can tell you it's very uncomfortable to sit there when the enemy plane has the advantage on you. But we had to stay with the bombers. We saw a couple of started runs towards down towards the bombers. And two of our planes would turn into them. And as soon as they did that, they broke off. And then the, these large white explosions started happening. We didn't know what the word first. Thing. Big white explosion with tendrils dropping down. We found out later that Japanese zeros up above us were dropping white phosphorus bombs. But luckily, their fuses were way off and none of them were too close. Very shortly after that, the zeros disappeared and any aircraft flak started popping all, all around us, coming up through the overcrest. And once again, it was, luckily, it was, none of it was too close. Just as we arrived at the Rabaul area, the clouds started breaking large holes. And the first thing that I saw, looking down towards the 
harbor that revolved, uh, this long line of Japanese warships steaming out of the harbor at high speed. They knew we were coming. Our division was assigned to strike in front of the torpedo planes. We had SBD dive bombers and TBF torpedo planes. We would always stay above the bombers and dive bombers until they all pushed over their dives. And then we'd push over and pass them on the way down and then going straight ahead of them. So we did that. I was diving from about 11, 12,000 feet. So it moved pretty fast. And heading through this long line of Japanese ships. Uh, some, I say now, an insane reason I picked up the biggest one there was a heavy cruiser of the Mogami class. The type of has a pagoda type superstructure. I was coming in on the starboard beam of the cruiser. We were still, oh, maybe three quarters, maybe a mile out. And every ship in this long line opened up, firing at us. Muzzle flashes from stem to stern, a lot of smoke. And I can attest to you that you can see an 80 shell coming towards you. <laughs> Head of cruiser opened up with our 80 main batteries. And these shells kind of start coming up. You can see them, they're rotating very slowly with a little stream of smoke behind them. And actually, if it looks too close, you really have time to move over. I hope it doesn't explode when it goes by. I went on in and I opened fire about 1,500, maybe 2,000 feet out. And every fifth round in our loading pattern was an armor piercing in center above it. And when it hits, it makes a very nice and bright flash. I can still see the stupid structure of the cruiser. Well, I wouldn't fire. There's so many flashes that look like a Christmas tree. I went up top of the cruiser about mass high. Kind of wondering how it had flown through the incredible garage. Later on, looking back, I couldn't help but say, you know, this is just like a big skeet range. Only the problem is, my plane was a clay pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> Passed over the top of the cruiser. I looked down in the gun traps. I got to see the Japanese gunners looking up. I pulled up and started heading back to the rendezvous point, which is about 10 miles to the southeast. I looked over across the bay. On the south end, side of the bay, the Japanese had a big Air Force base. And right above that, Jap Air Base, there was this incredible melee going on. A series like the things you used to see in World War I movies. Planes all over the sky, planes exploding, going on flames, parachutes. There were a lot of big splashes in, in the bay where the plane took hit. So, I, Headed over that way. And about halfway over, I saw a lone F 6 F Hellcat going on a certain level. And there was a zero, maybe two or three hundred feet behind me. And when it pounded in the F 6 F, the 20 millimeter cannon shells, I could see big pieces of metal fly off the Hellcat. Uh, was obviously incapacitated. 
because he made no evasive action at all. So I came in right behind the zero, slightly below me, slightly to the left, fairly sharp birds. And I had to to pull up a little bit go right over the top of me. And as I went over the top, I looked down right into the top of the zero. It couldn't have been more than a second so since I fired. And all the way, I saw flames in the cockpit as you were coming under, under the instrument panel. And I looked up, and there's another zero up and to my right. I headed for that. I was closing, just waiting to get into range of fire. And all of a sudden, a very loud uh, noise occurred. That's what I can describe it. If you visualize yourself standing in a, in a tin shed and somebody throws a large handful of rocks against the outside, well, that's what it sounds like when you're playing to get hit by machine gun bullets. It's very loud. And you can actually feel the impact of the bullets hitting the plane. I reacted, I kicked it over into a half snapper old head straight down. I looked back, and sure enough, there were a pair of zeros back there. And from the lead plane, there was a big stream of red traces. Coming toward me from the 7.7 machine gun in the nose of the zero. I no sooner got headed straight down, I looked up and there was another zero coming. By right then I was in perfect position from the overhead run. I had bad enough time, got enough lead on me, I fired a short bird and exploded. Well, I figured I had enough of that, so I headed on back to the rendezvous point. <laughs> and climbed on up. And we joined up with the mamas, flew back to the carrier. When I got back on board the ship, I looked at my plane. Each wing had about a dozen 7.7 machine gun bullet holes in it. But they're all straight down through. What had happened, I was concentrating on closing on the zero ahead of me, and I was violating a very basic combat thing you didn't do. You didn't, you didn't stop checking, keep going, what's going on all around. So this Japanese pilot had made an overhead run on me. He hit my plane just at the same time the zero behind me opened up. The way the Japanese worked, they had two 717 machine guns and two 20 meter cannon. But they had to only carry a very limited number of rounds in the 20s. The early ones only had 60 rounds per gun, and the latest ones had 100. So they would range in with a 7.7 machine gun. When they got hit to the 7.7, they'd punch off the, the 20s. So, so when I reacted and got out of the airspace. I thought I left a whole bunch of centimeters shells going right past you. I've always wanted to thank that Japanese pilot that made the overhead of the at that moment, because I think he saved my neck. <laughs> that, that was what I call my most memorable flight. There were a lot more, but that's about all I have to I think we're uh, we're getting close to uh, questions and answers. Um, if you think about this, when you ask a question, um, 
This young man, uh, you might ask him about the time he sunk an ocean liner. Um, <laughs> he learned all about bombing that day. Uh, you might ask Stocky um, if you're interested. Uh, he had an uh, aerial engagement with a man by the name of Otto Schultz, and Stocky came out of it. And uh, that uh, might, might be a question you might ask. And uh, Mac had a, a very uh, unique encounter with a Japanese Betty Bomber. So those are questions that if you don't know about, you might ask. But uh, I'll turn it over to Harold. Well, you got me interested. Uh, Herb, why don't you tell us about the uh, encounter with the ship? I think that would be of interest. OK. This was the most unusual situation. Our mission in Africa with the P-38 basically was to escort bombers. Uh, occasionally we got called on to do some low altitude mission, go straight on the runway or, or something like that. But uh, on this particular occasion, our boss, General Atkinson, who was the wing commander of the B-17 outfit we were attached to, <coughs> came to us and asked if we would learn to dive bomb with a P-38. Well, the, the P-38 and E and F models only had racks between the fuselage and the engine itself. They didn't any have, have any racks outboard of the engines. So all we could carry were two items two belly tanks or two bombs on these racks and inboard. But anyway, he came and said, and said, we want you to learn how to dive bomb. And my group commander said, well, why do you want us to learn to dive bomb with all these B-17s and 24s and so on? I mean, why with a P-38? He said, well, you guys could sneak in. You could defend yourself if you were attacked. Yeah. Uh, now, if, if we had, uh, say, a general, an uh, Army general asked us to say, we got to have that bridge destroyed this afternoon. Well, we couldn't raise enough uh, uh, bombers to go over and, and get that bridge. But you guys could hang a bomb, be off the ground in 15 or 20 minutes, and go bomb the bridge. And I said, well, the thing we have to learn how to do is how to hit the damn thing. <laughs> well, anyway, so we got some guys together and asked a little bit about it. And we decided it was basically impossible to dive bomb with a P-38 with any accuracy. So we had an engineering officer that was pretty good, and he wanted one of the gentlemen to know why. Why do you want to want us to do that? And and he got the explanation. The general came back and said, but I want you guys to give it a try anyway. So we got busy and we studied bomb trajectories and so on. A P-38 had an arc of the propeller, and uh, it, the, the rack was in the arc of the propeller. So if we were going to dive bomb straight down, the bomb would hit the propeller. So we calculated that about a 60 degree dive angle, it would fall free of the prop. Uh, we had the trajectories of bombs of various sizes and so on. So we figured that perhaps 60 degrees would be pretty good. So we took scotch tape, actually it was masking tape, and we put it on the windshield to, so that when the airplane was at a 60 degree dive angle, the, the tape was level with the earth. So we could get a pretty accurate 60 degree dive angle. So that would work out all right. And uh, we could you know, come, you know, you know, pull out the dive and so on. And we got to thinking, well, how high do we have to pull out to escape the bomb blast? And we figured out a 2,000 pounder, we would have to be 3,500 feet high, or we would block the crap that would come up and shoot us down. So we worked all this thing out and got it pretty well organized. And the General Atkins says, I'm going to send you guys 200 little 25 pound Blue Boy practice bombs, and you go ahead and go out and practice and see what you can come up with. So we went out on a dry lake bed there and drew a circle, no, I shouldn't say a circle, an oval about 200 feet long and maybe 100 feet wide. And the 36 of us went out and dropped 200 pounds. And you know where the safest place would have been? <laughs> it's just like that circle. We never got it on another one. <laughs> so we decided that it was kind of an impossible situation to dive bomb with a P-38 with any degree of accuracy. Well, anyway, about two or three weeks later, we got an order to, to bomb an airport under construction in northern Sicily, or Sardinia, northern Sardinia. And so uh, 
They said, we want you to take a 2,000 pound bomb on one side, the belly tank on the other, other go up to this uh, airport that's under construction in the northern part of the, of the island, and then first dive bomb the runways and, and taxiways and many parking areas and so on, and then drop your, drop your bombs, drop your drop tanks and then strafe them and start fires and so on. I thought, well, that'd be a lot of fun to do, you know? But at any rate, uh, so we took off and everything is going fine until we got to about the middle of Sardinia and we hit Monterey type fog. And here I'm leaving 12 airplanes with 2,000 pound bombs on one side and big belly tanks on the other. And, and we're getting closer formation to fly formation. I'm flying instruments and they're closing in on me real close. And I figured, the hell with this, you know, if I said, guys, we're going to abort the mission. We'll come back tomorrow and try it. I don't want to try to fly, fly tight formation in this fog. So we climbed up out of the fog and turned back southbound, climbed up to about 10,000 feet. And when we reached the lower end of Sardinia, we got anti-aircraft fire. Somebody was shooting at us. We couldn't figure out where it was. We were three or four miles offshore. And so we started a big circle, you know, spreading out and widening, widening the circle. The circle was and everybody's looking down to try and find out where this, uh, gunnery, this stuff is coming from. And I'd gone about a quarter of the way around the circle when I saw the flashes coming out of the water. And I called the guys and I said, I think it's a submarine that's shooting at us. You know? we're, we must be enemy to them. P-38 is pretty recognizable, you know. Well, anyway, so we're looking and I got about another halfway around the circle and the sun was just right and it was a great big boat painted two two shades of blue and two shades of gray. A great big sucker, you know? And I kind of, holy smoke, you know, what is that? Well, anyway, uh, they're shooting at us. We might as well practice bombing on that sucker. <laughs> so I, I arranged to, got us all in trail, and then I went, went uh, east, west, and then turned southbound so I could dive, dive bomb on the way out. And I said, well, they might as well to see what goes on. And so, about 3,500 feet, I, I had a pepper right, right in kind of in line with the boat, or about, a, about a boat length ahead of it, kind of in line with it. And as I passed through about 4,500 feet, I pickled off on the bomb. And my element leader, was, his name was Sidney Weatherford. And five seconds later, I heard Sidney say, everybody hold your bomb. Herb got a direct hit, his bomb went down the smokestack. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so we stayed there and we circled for about 20 minutes because they obviously had the aircraft fire stopped. Yeah, and we circled for about 20 minutes and the debris was, must have been 25, 3,500 feet high. I couldn't believe the, the, So it. So obviously the bomb went down and hit the boilers and the boilers blew. And then we saw the smoke and the flames start coming up and then, and then the, a little bit later, the, we went in real close and took a look and there was guys jumping overboard and stuff like that. Well, anyway, we, when we got back down, and we, the, our intelligence officer uh, took the report and sent it forward to our headquarters. And three hours later, here comes General Atkinson down in his Jeep and a, his the driver he said, what the hell are you guys trying to prove anyway? Dive on with a P-38, you already proved it was impossible. What do you think I'm going to believe this kind of <laughs> well, anyway, uh, all I could say, well, sir, I didn't see the bomb hit, but the other 11 guys did. <laughs> and so my intelligence officer said, General, why, why don't you send a reconnaissance airplane up and, and take a picture of this, and, and we can prove it one way or another, whether the boat was sunk or what, what occurred. And General Atkinson thought, and he says, well, it costs a lot of money to send the recce out, but uh, I guess I can do that. So that night, they, that afternoon, late afternoon, they sent the reconnaissance out. Next morning, we got the picture, and it was the luxury liner Rex that had been converted to a true carrier, about a 700-foot luxury liner. There were four of these boats in the early 30s, these were the luxury boats that went between Rome and London and New York. There was four of them. 
And I say the luck the wreck was was one of those four. Sun 
sunk, and had it not been sunk, would the war, would the picture of the war would have been a little different for the Bismarck. The aircraft carrier? Actually, the Bismarck, I believe, was a large battleship <clears throat> that the Germans, and I believe that the British caught it off uh, uh, the south of, uh, of uh, England, and they torpedoed the rudder, and the rudder got stuck, and then the Kingfish finished it off. But the question to you is, um, what would have happened had the Bismarck, Bismarck not been knocked out of commission? Because you think it was heading down south. Yeah. Well, that one's a hard, uh, that's a very hard question to answer for uh, most of us who are not very familiar with boats. But uh, I think that they... Uh, you know, Bert, actually you are familiar with boats. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone but, on the wrecks would dispute uh, that. <laughs> uh, having sunk a boat. <laughs> but uh, it's not how big the Bismarck was, it would be the size of the bomb. That it, was, that, it was, that it was penetrated with. And if, if, if a couple of good fighter pilots who could put a bomb where they wanted to, they could have sunk it. I think I'll get in on Yeah, I, 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 I think it would really happen. Well, the, this brings up the subject of improvement of, of fighter aircraft and so on. I'd like to talk a little bit about improvements and how things go on. Uh, for instance, uh, how about delivering an atomic weapon any place in the world with a fighter aircraft? Can it be done? Yes, yes. How did this occur? Well, the improvements that were made in industry and the Air Force brought this kind of activity along. For instance, we wanted to deliver, we, we tried to uh, first to, to attach a, a dummy uh, weapon, atomic weapon, to an F-84 and see if we could, if we could toss that bomb uh, you know, in any way possible or fly high enough. Well, the first thing we elected is the bomber can fly high and deliver the bomb accurately, but he's, a, but he's subject to other enemy aircraft and anti-aircraft fire. How about delivering an atomic weapon when a, a, a small jet aircraft could sneak in at low level? So, this particular subject was examined to see if it would be possible to do so. And I got involved with Bob Hoover then, who was testing for North American, and we discussed this situation, how to do this. So he thought maybe there might be a way to do it, and he, he worked with us, and I got called in on, on the subject a few times with him with North American, and then decided that, that the best way to do it, it to protect the pilot, would be to develop a system that absolutely low altitude, okay? And then you deliver the, the weapon at, and, and gain high altitude at the same time. So the basic thing that came out was the F-84 the F couldn't do it because it couldn't go fast enough and high enough, and neither could the F-86. In other words, you had to get high enough, throw the weapon up, and then it turns around and falls down. But the, Airplanes weren't fast enough or could, do, or could go high enough to escape the bomb blast. But when the F-100 came along with the afterburner, Bob came to me and said, Herb, I think we can do it with an F-100. Okay. So we worked with this to, to see and, and, and how we could work the system out so that a lieutenant or a captain or a relatively junior officer could do this. Well, anyway, what it turned out to be is the F-100 with a, with a small atomic weapon, yeah, rather small atomic weapon, could come in at low altitude, two or three hundred feet off the ground, okay? Now, he could get any place in the world by mid-air refueling. You've seen the probe where you could go and plug in with a tanker, okay, take on your full load of, of fuel, go as far as you want, and then go down to low altitude over the enemy territory and deliver the weapon. And the way it was done, is you would come down real low and find the target, and you would make a small offset of, of the target to compensate for wind drift. 
And then as you cross the target, you go into afterburner. You're doing 500 knots now. You go into afterburner and you'll maintain the 500 knots. Okay? And you pull up, you'll 4G pull. And just as the airplane gets just beyond the vertical, the gyro in the airplane releases the weapon. And the weapon goes straight on up to about 35,000 feet. You make sure the afterburner stays lit, as you know. And, and, and you roll up and, and maintain your altitude and escape as fast as possible. Then the weapon turns around and falls back down and blows up. And that's the way today we can deliver an atomic weapon any place in the world with a single engine fighter with one pilot on board. And that's the way progress has taken its place. I was the division commander in Misawa, Japan, and whether you realize it or not, we were sitting alert with fighters with atomic weapons during those years, 20, 30 years ago. That's how, how much we have progressed in what the fighter can do today. On 7 April 1945, our Navy planes caught the Japanese battleship Yamato, which was the biggest battleship in the world at that time. They caught it out in the open, and our dive bombers, torpedo planes, and fighters, in less than one hour, this huge battleship was on the bottom. This is for uh, Wing Commander Edwards. You were flying P-40s in North Africa and going up against the 109s, which I believe were a superior airplane. Could you talk a little bit about the tactics you use to fight against the 109s? Well, they, you're right. The 109 was uh, superior to the P-40, uh, with the exception that we could turn inside the 109. And uh, usually they attack from above, so this they, their speed was much more than uh, normal, and we could still turn very easily turn inside. So our main tactic, if we were being attacked like that, was to turn into them, and uh, they would pull up and come around and try and attack again in a similar fashion. Sometimes, uh, depending on the situation, uh, we usually flew in, in, in four, the, the finger four formation, four, four P-40s, and they, everybody had to turn around in the same axis, complete, come out the same way, in order to do this properly. So that if the 109 continued his attack, he was facing the guns of four aircraft, and they didn't like that, and they'd pull up. However, if there were just one or two of us and they were attacking, sometimes we would try to suck them in. You'd start your turn, and, and they would try to follow, and you would hope that they continue to follow. And you'd watch behind. As long as his nose didn't come up in front of you, he couldn't hit you. Uh, you had to know this, of course. And they, they continued the turn. And he, as you turned and pulled G, you, you'd lose your airspeed, and so would he. So that he, he couldn't get away in a hurry if he wanted to know, if he kept up his turn. So usually they'd break off and try to climb away right away. And you could turn back on them and, and shoot at them. That was at one tactic. Um, we could, uh, in the dive, they would initially dive away, but you could catch them in a long dive. In a climb, you couldn't climb with them because you would stall out and they'd come back on top of you. So it was a um, cat and mouse game all the time. Sometimes we learned that uh, um, if you're a bomber escorting and, and you're a close escort or a medium, you can't leave the bombers and then under any condition. So you have to es take them into their target and bring them out. But those that were in top cover, they had a free, free lands to move around and, and you could possibly attack the Germans as they were coming to break up their forces and upset them. They seem to always operate on a definite system. And they were not uh, agile, and uh, I think it's a better word, that, that the Canadians and Americans had of changing the system they're using to make it fit the occasion. They didn't seem to be able to do that like we could. 
they had to do things a certain way, and sometimes we could take advantage of this. Um, they didn't like to go below us. They, they, did, they did a lot of strafing, of course, and a little bit of dive bombing, but they didn't like to be down on the ground where we might catch them and be on equal terms. And they uh, also, uh, even though they had a lot of hot shots, they had people racking up scores, and I think they were going for scores, so they would go after the fighters. And sometimes they would make a mistake or get a little too cocky, and, and we would have a chance. And in my case, if I had a chance to do it, I didn't want to miss in case he would turn on me. And, and it was very seldom that this happened. Does that answer the question? I have a question back here now. I have two uh, short questions. First of all, I would like to hear the story of uh, McWerther, is it? Um, attacking the Betty Bomber. And also, um, with the exception of the P-38, you guys all flew aircraft with uh, 50 caliber or smaller machine guns, whereas it seemed like the uh, German aircraft flew with a lot more cannons in their loadouts. And I was wondering, um, were you very confident in the gun packages that you had, and or did you wish to have a more cannon type loadout in your airplanes? Uh, I might try to answer that question if I understood what you said. Uh, the P-38, of course, had the guns in the nose, and uh, the, the firepower with that situation uh, was such that the ME-109 FW pilots and so on did not like a head-on pass, because we had much more firepower than they did. Uh, our initial escort tactics were we were not allowed to leave the bombers except to turn in to the enemy. And so they would bounce us, we would turn into them, we wouldn't chase them, and then we'd go back and join the bombers, and then they kept pecking at us like that. Well, on a mission that we went on, uh, which I'll tell you about and why, how come the, 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 the statistics and the, the, the way we did it changed, uh, we were just going to have a maximum effort uh, with the heavies over Italy. And this was going to take all three of the P-38 groups in Africa, and each group had to make another, had to make another squadron uh, with excess pilots. So we had a large number of P-38s doing escort, and then it was a large effort with not only B-17s, but uh, B-24s, and preceding us were the, were the, the MIPS, the B-24s. Uh, so uh, our B, uh, uh, the, the twin-engine bombers. At any rate, the, the whole thing was, a, the, was set up that there was an IP that the lead B-17 was supposed to go across. Then he was supposed to go inland on Italy to an IP, turn northbound, and then to a second IP and an outbound, so that if anybody got had, had to bail out, it would be over water so they could be picked up. Well, the lead bunch of B-17s, the, the 18 of them, turned to the to the second IP initially instead of going to the to the first IP. And that left 18 B-17s all, all by themselves out here with about 400 of the heavies in close formation here. Well, I was leading the first group and I recognized that, boy, those 17s are gonna catch hell. Uh, 18 B-17s all by themselves. So sure enough, uh, I told, I called Hank Trollope, who was a deputy uh, leader that day. I said, Hank, you take over. I'm taking my squadron over to those B-17s. So the 12 of us went over to, to escort the, the uh, lone B-17s. And sure enough, there was about 20 uh, enemy fighters coming up off the ground. We could see them coming uh, right up towards those 18 B-17s. And I thought, man, they are really going to get hell. So I decided we would not stay with the bombers. We would go after those airplanes. So the 12 of us and another squadron went after these guys coming up, coming up after them. Okay. And we chased them and, and took, in other words, we prevented them from getting even to the bombers. To make a long story short, we shot down 22 enemy aircraft that day, the best we'd ever had. That night, the order came through. The order will be canceled to stay with the bombers. 
take the philosophy as go get them today and they can't come back up and shoot at you tomorrow.
tagged me with this moniker of one slug a quarter. <laughs>